spinner assignment uh, starting with chapter 7 of, uh, I guess, 18, 19, 20, and 21. So what we're trying to, the, the basic question we're trying to answer is the following. Let's go back to the beginning. This is what we're going to try to develop, and in fact, we're going to actually finish it today. In the next okay, we have 25 minutes, we're going to finish it. This, the, here's the following problem. We know that the random number table, and that's really a population, a population of individuals, we'll call them X, happens to have like threes and sevens and sixes and zeros and nines and fives. You know, it runs between, it runs between zero to nine. If you want to be mathematical about it, then that was the early part of the spinner assignment was to, you know, write out the top probability d distribution function, uh, the chance of this happening, the P of X was one out of 10 or 0.1. And we happen to know this population, if it's truly a, a good random number table should have a middle value of 4.5. We established that by early parts of the spinner assignment. We know the amount of spread when, pl when plugged into the formula for sigma is 2.87. That's not, this is pretty commonsensical between zero and nine. This is not commonsensical necessarily. But we're gonna take a, 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 a sample of numbers. How many numbers? Five numbers because that's what it's a small number and it's easy to deal with. Or if you want to think of it schematically in this point of view, we're taking a sample of five numbers, and we're creating an average of those five numbers. Now, when you take five numbers, you can get a three, zero, seven, six, four, and the average comes out to 4.6. You take another five numbers, it might come out to 3.8. Take another five numbers. So sometimes they come out a little bit low. Most of the time, they come out medium, like 4.6, 4.8. And sometimes they come out high, like 6.2 or 6.4 or 7.2. That, what's common sense, is made a little more dramatic by actually doing the spinner assignment. And, and uh, Nakia took 1,000, like I think she's supposed to, and she got 4.8 to 3, 4.6, 3.4, 4.66, 3.6. I'm not going to bother writing it on the board, but these are the typical numbers you can get. The highest number, and this, this is just the first of many pages, uh, the highest number here is like 6.8. The lowest number was 1.6. So she got between 1.6 and 6.8 is her, you know, practically, and probably if you look at all thousand numbers, you're gonna get a similar type of a uh, range. So the question is, what does those X bars look like? I've got, by the way, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. So the question we're gonna try to answer it today in the main part of today's chapter, which by itself is not that important, but it's really necessary for chapter eight, is how often would you get an X bar bigger than now on the sheet it's going to say 6.3, so in class we'll use a 5.7. So how often are you going to get an X bar? Now you realize, now, how often do you get an X bar bigger than 5.7? Well, you know, sometimes you get like, five, like she got here, a 6.8, a 6.6, um, a 6.4, a 6.2, you know, on occasion, you, you do get numbers bigger than 5.7. Most of the time, you get something close to 4.5, which is a true average, but sometimes you get it bigger. So the question is, how often do you get it bigger? And it turns out there are two ways to get the answer. The, the second way, which we'll spend most of the period talking about, is using the Z table, because as one of the things you were supposed to establish for today's, by doing today's spinner assignment, and I think I mentioned this at the end of the last class, is that the X bars will follow a bell-shaped curve, and we'll talk about that in a second. And since the X bars follow a bell-shaped curve, probabilities involving the, the X bars is basically the same stuff we learned about in chapter six, which means you go to the Z table. But there's an easier way of doing it, easier if, you have a, if you're good with computers, and that is by counting. If you go down your list of 1,000 X bars and count how many are bigger than 5.7, now, how many are there? I'm going to let you do this right now. Can you, can you pick it up? Uh, just how many are bigger than 5.7? If anybody else did it, I don't think anybody else did it. Just kick, take, do a quick, quick count. Like 5.8, 6. Seven. seven out of how many? Because you don't have a. Seven out of 35. Okay, so seven, what is that as a percentage? That's one out of, one out of seven, seven uh, one out of five? Is that 20%? Seven out of five, one out of five. So it's about 
So you're now, the key, if you realize if, you're, if I actually count it among the thousand, it'll be more, more, more exact. The more you have, the better it is. And if everybody did it, for, if everybody co cooperated with the homework, and you got seven, and you got 16, and you got 11, taking the average of the whole class would be a really great answer. So the point is you can, by actually physically doing a Monte Carlo simulation, as we told you last time, you can get the answer directly without any fancy formula, just by actually literally doing what we're trying to do here. The question is, how do you do it by the exact method, not having to write a program and look down a 1,000 numbers? And the answer, which is now the essence of chapter seven, is based on the following three pictures. Every, what I'm trying to claim is every single example in chapter seven can be solved by making three pictures. Now, you don't have to make any pictures. If you want to do it like in your head, that's fine. But three pictures makes this whole thing very organized. The first picture tells you, what do you know about the population? Well, we know the middle value is 4.5. Notice sigma is 2.87. And you'll be told that in every specific example. We'll call that the x representing individuals in the population. The second picture is called the x-bar picture. Now, what do we know about the x-bar picture? What, what is a typical x-bar? Well, most x-bar should be around, since we're picking five numbers that cluster around 4.5, most averages should be around 4.5, and you may get a 4.6 very often, a 4.8, a 3.8, a 3.6. So we did this last time. We'll do it again quickly. How many do you think will be between zero and uh, Nakia, since you're the only person that did it, Nakia? How many were between zero and one? And I'll answer for you. The answer, uh, what I saw on your page were none. Okay, you had none. How many between one and two? I think you got one out of 34, right? You got one there. I got 1.8 or something. How many between two and three? You don't have to tell me, but you're going to get a few more of those. How many between three and four? There should be a lot of those. Between four and five, a really large number of those, certainly as a percentage. Between five and six? Between six and seven, typically, again, everybody's going to be doing this individually with different numbers, but between seven and eight, and between eight and nine, and could you get higher than nine? No, if you spin the spinner five times, if you pick five nines, nine, 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 which is very unlikely, it's one out of 100,000, then this will come out to exactly nine. So the highest you could have is nine, the lowest you can have is zero. But after all is said and done, what does the X-bar picture look like? It's going to look like a bell-shaped curve. That's what we established last time, and in fact, if I got if you did it like 10 million times with a computer and to have the computer draw a histogram for you, it'd be a perfect bell-shaped curve. So instead of making this picture like this, I'm going to actually talk about from now on, in fact, we don't even need the bottom part of it, we just need that the X-bar picture will be a bell-shaped curve. Now, how do we know that? From three points of view. There's a mathematical proof called the central limit theorem. You should write that down and be aware, read that paragraph in the book about it. The central limit theorem predicts mathematically it has to be a bell-shaped curve under certain general conditions. Secondly, common sense, because when I just said to you that you'll get very few of those, a few of those, a lot of those, that's common sense. And finally, by the spinner assignment, by experience, we're doing it. Okay, by just by doing the spinner assignment, having experience with physically taking samples from under these conditions, you can see that, in fact, lo and behold, and when Kia didn't do it, no one else did it, you're going to get a bell-shaped curve when you do that last part of the assignment, number 18, I believe it was, or 19. Now, what do we know about this bell-shaped curve? We know, first of all, what is its middle value? What is the typical average? In other words, if you take all those averages, take the Kia's list of 1,000 averages, and you get the average of the averages. What do you think the average of the averages? What's going to be the average of all those averages? No, no, no. Common sense would be 4.5. That's the answer I was hoping to get. And what do you actually get in the key? So 4.52. The point is, it's, she took 1,000. Very close. So 4.5 is a common sense answer, which of course can be proven mathematically. I'm not going to show you the proof, but there's a proof that the average of the average has got to be 4.5. And doing it by the spinner assignment will verify that fact. Um, the key, I owe you one of these things so far. Thank you. This is for you when you get a chance. Um, now, I should point out to you that this picture is called the sampling distribution of the mean. The sampling distribution of the mean. That's the fancy name for this picture. And we know three things about the, the sampling distribution of the mean. The mean is the, the, the x bar that we care about. What do we know about it? It follows a bell-shaped curve, which is a, right away an important property. We know its middle value got to be the same as the middle value of the population where these numbers are coming from. Of course, every example, you start with a different population with a different middle value. But this, these two numbers will always be the same. And finally, what is the spread among these? The spread is a sigma. 
but we don't want to confuse